Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Vibrant Body and Abundant Life series. This is an inspiring, empowering podcast series where some of the world's cutting-edge mind, body, spirit, healers, coaches, and leaders coming together to share with you their wisdom and their tools so that you can move beyond fear and self-doubt, limiting beliefs, heal pain, illness, and past trauma. So I am your host, Tanya Penny, occupational therapist, vibrant body, and abundant life catalyst and coach. And I'm here because I'm devoted to helping you have a healthy body, peaceful mind, and balanced life. So you can fully live your life of passion, purpose, with complete abundance and freedom. So today, I'm excited to share the wisdom of me. (laughs) We're going to be diving into discovering and shifting your beliefs. So as many of you might have heard, I have been on a tour, um, book signing and workshop tour, and I just got back last Sunday. So for the months of April and May, I decided just to host myself and then get back into hosting more experts starting in June. So if you didn't hear that, I'm just kind of letting you know what's, what's happening with the podcast. So today I'm going to be giving you lots of content, tools, and then also I'll be taking a few questions at the end of the call. And the way that you can submit those. I see some of you have already been submitting some on the webcast. Those of you on the webcast, under the Q&A, there's a box. Um, There's a box on the bottom of the screen, I believe it is. And just a little reminder that when you submit a question, especially on the webcast, um, it really helps me to have as much information as possible. So if there's something you want to heal and you're not sure what belief is holding you back, give me a little more information. Um, make sure you give me information. What is it that you're trying to heal? Okay. Um, that, can, that can help me to guide you um, just because we're not on the phone and I can't ask you more questions. So, um, yeah, so just be as specific as possible. You know, give me, give me some good details those of you on the webcast. And if you're on the phone, you can raise your hand star two. And again, I'll usually have time to take one to two, sometimes even three questions at the end. Um, I'd like to go no longer than about 60 minutes. Um, Yeah, I think that's about it as far as little agenda things. And for those of you who are new to me, As I said earlier, I'm an occupational therapist by degree, and at this point in my life, I call myself a vibrant body and abundant life catalyst and coach. And what I do is I teach, empower, and support you to heal chronic illness and past trauma using my mind-body-spirit methodology. So for 25 years of my own life, I had experienced anxiety and depression, pain, excess weight, Um, and a lot of past abuse. And in 2004, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And that was really my wake-up call that there were some deeper issues that were needing my love and attention and relief, things that medication, Western medicine, and lifestyle changes alone, like diet, could not change. So quite honestly, it wasn't easy, and it really, I really had to go internal and do some of that deep internal work. And for me, it wasn't quick. It took about three years, but I did eventually heal to the point of taking no medication and no longer having symptoms. Um, So that's why I'm here. That's what I'm about. I do believe there's a place and time for doctors in Western medicine, but I also know from my experience and working with thousands of others that it usually takes a lot more for full healing to occur. So, That's my scoop. So let's go ahead and move into talking about discovering and shifting your beliefs. So most of us that are listening to this, whether you're live today or you're listening to the replay, most of you know that your beliefs are what drives your actions every day, what you believe about yourself in the world, and I will talk about the seven life areas in, a little later in today's call, 
that um, that really is what drives our actions. And our beliefs also attract and create our lives. And again, the seven life areas. So if there's something in your life that you want to shift, it might be your health for a lot of you. It might be relationships. It might be money issues. It might be more fully living your purpose. It could have to do with spirituality or living your passion. Those are the seven life areas. Um, your self-connection and self-care, um, that's number one. You're going to, if you want to shift any one of those areas, you're going to want to look at what you believe, okay, because it's your beliefs that are either keeping you stuck in or helping you to create what you desire. So I often get asked, where do beliefs come from? And in a nutshell, they come from our family, they come from religion, our culture, they can also come from our past lives. So you could have carried forward a belief from a past life given experience you had in your past life. And they can be passed down from ancestors in our DNA as well. So that's kind of the short answer of where our beliefs come from. And quite honestly, you know, I always say let's look back but not stare. It can be kind of interesting to see where your beliefs come from. And sometimes because we're usually unaware of our beliefs, we do want to look at our past. Um, our childhood growing up, what our parents said and did, or what we saw and heard, specific to the seven life areas. And so, yeah, it can be helpful to help you discover what beliefs that you hold that's holding you back, but we don't need to spend too much time on that otherwise, um, pinpointing exactly where it comes from, because that can be a little waste of time. It can be a little bit of a an energy and a time suck if we spend too much time on that. So let's see, what next? Um, so what I have found to be true for myself and others is that in order to shift a belief or set a belief system, you must first become aware of what it is that you believe. Okay, it's hard to shift something you're not aware of. So what is it, what is the belief that's holding you back? And then the next piece that's really important is accepting that you hold this belief. So if you try to push it away, make it wrong, judge it as wrong or bad, then you're going to likely stay stuck in it. Anything we resist persists. Just like anything that we're not aware of, we can't really focus on and, and heal, right? So awareness and acceptance is key when it comes to shifting this part, this aspect of yourself. So many of our beliefs also we created given what we experienced growing up. Okay, so maybe I'm going to just use an example here. Maybe you expressed yourself, your wants, needs, or desires growing up, and time after time you got shot down, criticized, maybe even physically hurt for doing so. So you're going to have a real strong belief then that expressing your wants, needs, and desires isn't safe or it'll cause conflict or you'll lose love if you do that, perhaps is the belief. Those are just a few common ones. So they can actually be created. Our beliefs can be formed given the experiences we had growing up, not just what we saw and heard. Okay. So again, how do we become aware of the belief that could be holding us back, whether it's in love or money, a health situation? And there are two ways that I have found are best to do that. One is to look at, look at your past. You know, if you have a breakdown in the area of love and relationships, look back and reflect on how were you treated by your mom and then how were you treated by your dad growing up? And then you want to look at how did they treat each other? Okay, those are going to be the basis for what you believe about love and relationships. And to be quite honest, a lot of us had very unhealthy role models. Um, of course, our parents were always doing the best that they could. And so there's no blame here for anybody because we're all in the same boat. <laughs> they got their shit passed down too. But we, you know, really want to just look at in this, 
case, how were we treated or not treated growing up, and how did our mom and dad treat each other in relationship? That is going to be, in terms of relationships, your blueprint, your belief blueprint. So looking back at our past can be helpful to discover what beliefs are holding us back now, and also just looking at your current reality. So if you have a, let's just say a money breakdown, you're going to want to, you know, let's just say it's a money breakdown of you make a lot of money, but then you never have any left at the end of the day. So maybe you're holding a belief that I either have to give it all away um, I'm only good at spending, not managing and growing money, like I grew up with. I was, I was told women are not good at managing money. money. They're only good at spending it. <laughs> so I did that for a long time. That belief was really ingrained in me. Um, and you could also have a belief if you make enough money but you never seem to have enough, maybe you're giving it away to other people. So you have a belief that says, I should give all my money to others or I should support everybody else. Um, and then you're not having any or enough left for you and your, your family, perhaps, or you and your passions. So those are just a couple of examples as to, you know, looking at your past to see which beliefs you hold and to look at your current breakdown, right, the area that's in breakdown that you want to heal. If you have a health breakdown, okay, this one can be a little trickier, can be. So when I'm working with my clients, I typically, whether it's the group program or one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, I give them a questionnaire that gives me, I ask for a pretty extensive past history. This gives me a lot of clues as to what you might believe okay, and why you might be having an illness or why you might be having a certain relationship breakdown or money breakdown. One of the other resources I use is Heal Your Body by Louise Hay. So I look up a certain symptom or illness, and that can also give me some guidance as to what might be holding you stuck or keeping you in this health breakdown, this illness. So I'll give you a, a personal example. Um, multiple sclerosis has a lot to do with fear, okay, the emotion of fear and being really rigid and controlling. Um, and typically we're rigid and controlling because of fear. And that made total sense for me because I grew up in a really chaotic household, so I did have a lot of fear. Um, and so when I got out into the real world, adulthood, I really dealt with feeling safe in the world, not feeling safe in the world, given the chaos and the abuse that I grew up with. And so I tended to be kind of rigid and controlling in order to feel safe in the world. Okay, so that was one of the things I had to work on healing, right, that I am safe and supported. That is the belief that I needed to work with versus I have to be, you know, control, I have to control and be rigid to be safe, just as an example. So let's move into, I'm going to actually move into the seven life areas that I just briefly touched on earlier, and I want to give you a really good example for each life area in terms of a situation, and then why you might have a certain belief, and then an opposite truth. And then after that, I'm going to share a few tools how to begin shifting the beliefs after you discover them, and then we'll open up for a few questions. All right. So let's do the first life area. Um, I call it self. And what I mean by self is self-connection self-trust, and self-love. That kind of falls under the category of self when you're working with me in any of my programs. So many of us have the belief, they say it's the most common belief in the world, that everyone has it to some degree. I'm not lovable and or worthy. Another way to say that is I'm not enough. Right? I'm not enough. I'm not good enough and all the other versions, smart enough, thin enough, pretty enough, you know, fill in the blank, right? The I'm not enough. I'm not lovable worthy, I'm not enough. So why might we hold this belief? So when you were growing up, if one parent didn't give you complete acceptance and love, 
And again, we're not blaming our parents. They did the best that they could, just like we're doing the best that we can. But if you didn't feel completely unconditionally, and many of us did not, um, accepted and loved for who you were, you're going to hold this belief that I'm not lovable or worthy. Now, some of you might have had it more extreme. Um, I was criticized a lot, criticized a lot, okay, um, by, my, by my dad, not by my mom. And you'd think, well, if only one parent does it and not the other, why would I have this belief? Because we need, it's, it's our mom and our dad. And for those of you who one of your parents was absent growing up, you're definitely going to hold that belief because they weren't present. A child automatically thinks of a parent's not present, that it's because they're not lovable and worthy. Okay. Um, yeah, so a lot of us, we really want to look at this area and this set of beliefs because it actually impacts all other six life areas. If you don't think you're lovable or worthy or good enough, it's going to impact your health. It's going to impact your relationships. You're going to attract people into your life who continue to show you you're not lovable and worthy, who treat you like your parents did. It's going to affect your money. It's going to affect your career, your purpose, um, all the life areas. So when we become aware of a belief, the I'm not lovable and worthy perhaps, um, another common one is I can't trust myself because maybe you've made a past quote-unquote mistake. And who hasn't? And I don't believe there are mistakes. I really don't. I believe there's just opportunities and experiences to learn and grow. But many of us hold the belief, I don't make good decisions or I can't trust myself. That would also fall into this area. So when you become aware of a belief in the self area, in all the areas really, really then asking yourself, okay, I know what the limiting or negative belief is, but what is the opposite truth? What is the opposite truth? Well, the opposite truth is I am lovable and worthy no matter how I was treated as a child. In parentheses, right? I am lovable and worthy just being me. A lot of people also have the belief, you know, I'm lovable only if I do this or I have to prove that I'm worthy. So one of my mentors and coaches says, do you know how you know you're worthy? Because you were born. And you wouldn't have been born if you weren't worth being born. <laughs> I love that. So I'm good enough. I am lovable. I am worthy. So for now, when you find a belief, when you discover a belief in a certain life area, write it down and then write down an opposite truth, even if you don't believe it. That's the cool thing right now. You don't have to believe it. And then later on, I'll talk about tools to help shift what we're going to do with those opposite truths and those limiting beliefs. Um, before I move on, I'm feeling guided to share, a lot of us have um, learned the law of attraction. So I'm feeling guided to speak on that right now. So there is something missing with the law of attraction. Many of my clients come to me and say, Tanya, I don't want to focus on the limiting or negative belief. I just want to focus on the truth and what I desire. And my response to that is, again, whatever we try to push away or resist or get rid of will persist. Okay, so we can't just do positive affirmations and desires, um, focus on the positive all day long without also working with this negative or fear-based belief that you're holding on to. Okay, so that is why we do this work. That's why just using positive affirmations and not doing the deeper work of shift, discovering and shifting the beliefs is necessary in order to fully heal or shift something in any of the life areas, um, in my experience. So let's move to the area of health next. And some common limiting beliefs that we hold in the area of health is I will continue to get worse. Healing takes a long time. Some of you might hold a belief that I'll never heal, right? It's not possible to heal. Again, when I was told that I had multiple sclerosis, and I believe they still say this, that there's no cure, right? That I will probably get worse, 
And if I take the medicine, the Western medicine, I might, you know, I might ward it off for a little bit. I might keep it at bay or I might not progress as much. Okay. So you might have been told the same thing if you have a health issue. If your parents have a certain health issue or someone in your family does, you might also hold the belief that it runs in the family. And just because it runs in the family, that means you're going to get it. So those are some common negative health-related beliefs. And again, you're going to want to work with an opposite truth. And here's the cool thing. People will say, yeah, but Western medicine, they don't have a cure, Tanya. So what? So what? Western medicine is not the be-all, end-all. What your doctor says is not the be-all, end-all. If I would have believed that, I wouldn't be running and hiking and camping and symptom-free today. Okay? So here's the thing with beliefs. We get to decide if we want to keep one or not. We can choose to believe in something or not. It is a choice. You have the power to change any belief for yourself, not for other people, just for yourself. So I chose to work with the belief I'm healing more every day. Right? I'm getting better every day. I will heal. I am guided and supported in, in my full healing. Okay, so those are some of the opposite truths that I worked with. So again, I'm just giving you a general example for each life area. And if you choose to move forward and work together in one of my programs, we'll go a lot deeper into all of these. Okay, spirituality. Ooh, this is a good one. <laughs> so a lot of us um, grew up with certain religions. And certain religions have certain beliefs that go with them. Like I grew up Catholic, and, you know, as a Catholic, you're pretty much taught that you were born a sinner. Okay? And, um, yeah. And there's a lot of guilt and shame. There's a lot of control tactics. Um, you know, you have to do this or you have to do that or you're a bad person. You'll be punished. You'll maybe even go to hell. So all religions have different beliefs. So, Religion and spirituality can be the same thing, but they don't have to be. And even in religion, you can choose to be in a religion and accept a certain belief or beliefs or not. Okay? I am completely a spiritual person now. I believe in God. I just don't believe in the God that I grew up with that was taught to me in Catholicism. You know, my belief used to be God is punishing. Um, you know, I have to behave a certain way or I'm not loved and accepted. If I make a mistake, I'm not loved and accepted or I'll be punished. Um, all hell will break loose, right? And now I choose to believe I am always loved and supported no matter what I do. I'm always guided and supported no matter what I do. And there's going to be a whole bunch of other beliefs um, around spirituality and religion as well, but I just wanted to give you a few to start with. So I recommend that as I'm going through these life areas, just reflect and even come back and re-listen to this on what, be, what might be true for you. What beliefs might you hold in these areas that could be holding you back from full health, happiness, and abundance? And abundance is not just money. It's love. It's support. Um, it's guidance. It's everything. All right. Let's move into the area of relationships and love. Ooh, goodness. So what I, have, what I have seen in pretty much everyone I've worked with, and it doesn't matter what health condition people come to me with, and I see people with anxiety, depression, weight issues, thyroid issues, cancer, um, autoimmune disorders, of course, uh, pretty much insomnia, fill in the blank. Um, pretty much all of us have some relationship beliefs and issues that need to be shifted in order to heal the illness, and obviously to heal the relationship breakdown if, you, if that's what you're experiencing. So many of us, again, grew up in relationships that, uh, with relationships where we didn't feel fully supported or accepted for who we were. We didn't think we could express. 
We had people tell us one thing and do another. So we have trust issues. We have trust issues. You know, I was talking to someone earlier today, having a one-on-one -on -one session, and, you know, this person kept putting on the filter of I was treating her like her father, which was not true. But because she, you know, held the belief that she was going to be attacked, because she was most of her life, the things that I was suggesting and the guidance I was offering, she saw it through the filter of attacking her and not supporting her when it was completely um, the opposite. It was love and compassion I was giving her. Um, so it, it's really interesting, these filters. You can almost look at your beliefs as like a filter that's keeping you from seeing reality, the world as it really is and can be. So um, I also grew up, my dad um, had cheated on my mom, so I grew up believing all men are cheaters. And for the first couple of years of my, uh, my adulthood, I attracted men who cheated on me. Right? And finally, I had to look at, why do I keep attracting men that cheated on me? It's not because I'm not worthy. It's because I held a belief given what my father did. Right? So I had to work with the opposite belief, the truth, that I'm only attracting men who are faithful, men who show up for me and are faithful. I'm wor worthy of a faithful partner. Right? And if someone does cheat, it's not because I'm not worthy. That's another one I had to work with. Also, I'm supported. Um, my dad didn't show up for me a lot as a child, even though he was physically there. Emotionally, he was not. And so I had the belief as well that I don't deserve time, love, and attention. Okay? Because he criticized me a lot and didn't really show up for me. So I had to work with the belief that I do deserve. I'm worthy of time, love, and attention. When it came to relationships and friendships with women, um, in that case, I had a mom who was a little bit overbearing. I'm an only child, and she was very protective of me and very, I would say, controlling because she worried a lot and didn't want me to make the same mistakes she did. Okay? Um, I was also kind of made to be her counselor growing up. So the beliefs that I had to work with so that I didn't continue to have relationships with women like that with my friends is that I, you know, I deserve support too. I was just always giving my mom support, right? I deserve support too. Or my mom was depressed often, so I thought I had the belief that I have to please her or make her happy, right? So as a child, I took that, on, that belief on. And then as an adult, I would get in relationships where I was like being supportive and trying to please others, and yet I was doing it at the expense of my health and happiness, and I wasn't really getting the support that I needed in friendship. So those are just a few, again, examples you may want to look at when it comes to friendships, when it comes to having a partnership, um, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, etc. Those are a few common ones. And then the opposite truth, I am supported, I deserve time, love, and attention, I can trust other people. Um, it's safe to express my wants, needs, and desires. And even my wants, needs, and desires are important right, in, re in the relationships I'm in. All right, moving forward. Money. Take a deep breath, everyone. I know a lot of people I'm working with right now are having money stuff come up this year um, in a bigger way. Um, I really faced my big money stuff last year, like really big. And so this year, it's not as intense for me um, around money. But I know for some of you it is. Um, so some common money beliefs that you might be holding, given what you saw, heard, or experienced growing up, is I'll never have enough money. I have to work hard to make enough money. I can't manage money. That's a common one, especially with a lot of women, but men too. Um, yeah, my sweetie had the I can't, you know, successfully manage, manage money thing, um, I believe. I can't support myself. That was a big one for me. Um, it kind of went with the whole I can't manage money. I always made enough money, which was the crazy thing. I always had a job that made a good income. And yet, at the end of the day, there was no money left. Or I had 
crazy debt, right? Like crazy debt. And so that was a combination of the belief that I can't manage money and I can't support myself. I had to work with those two beliefs big time in order to shift some of my money stuff and even to leave my marriage. Um, A lot of women and even some men stay in relationships that they really don't want to be in any longer, that they're actually being guided to leave because people think I can't support myself um, financially and or emotionally, right? But in this, in this case, we're talking about money. Um, if, I, if I leave this relationship, I'll be alone, right? That's another kind of relationship one. I'm backtracking a little bit. But so again, what would be the opposite truth to the belief that you discover around money? I always have an abundance of money. I am easily receiving money. I am easily managing and growing my money. I am easily supporting myself, just to name a few. So it did take me a leap of faith, right, to leave my marriage, um, because that's what I was being guided to do, and also leave my job and start my own business. I had to face those beliefs, those money beliefs, in both of those cases. Um, I also had an issue with, uh, sometimes I didn't have money because I had an issue with giving it away, right? So I had a saying that said, um, I have to give people money for them to love me, for them to spend time with me. And I think that one really came from my dad gave me money, even though he didn't give me the time, love, and attention. So I think that one kind of came from there in a weird way for some reason. So um, an opposite for if you struggle with that one might be to work with is, you know, I, people love me no matter what I give them, right? I don't have to give people money in order for them to like me, to be in a relationship with me, to be my friend. A common question I get is how do I know if I'm overgiving in terms of money or time, right? And the simple answer is, are you doing it at the expense of yourself? Are you giving all your money to a sibling or a parent, and then you're not having enough to take care of your needs, your needs, wants, and desires? Okay. Are you giving all your time, and you don't have enough time to take care of your wants, needs, and desires? So those are, that's like the simple, in a nutshell, how you know <laughs> if you are overgiving. Um, and that really a lot of times will fall into what I call the superwoman or superhuman belief system or people pleasing. You might overgive in order to please others, to get their love, attention, and approval, or because you think you're responsible for them. Okay, so there's a lot of parents who have adult children who continue to overgive money because they think, well, I'm their parent, I have to. When the truth is, you're enabling your child more than likely and, you know, maybe give them a loan but have an agreement made. Um, Once kids are, you know, out of the nest, they need to start taking some responsibility. Now, that doesn't mean you don't loan them money, right? But, yeah, I just felt the need to, I guess, say that today (laughs) because some of you um, might be struggling with that, I'm guessing. So um, you might have heard me talk about many of you the three Ps. So when I talk about pretending to be super human, woman or man, people pleasing or perfection, right? The I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable worthy is the perfection piece. Um, that's what I'm talking about. So a lot of these kind of are interwoven into these areas that we're discussing today. Okay. Let's move next to our passion. So when I say passion, I mean the things you love to do. Some people call them hobbies. So what can hold you back from, from having fun, from doing things you enjoy? Um, you might have a belief that I don't have time. Uh, taking time to do fun things when there's work to do isn't okay. All the work has to be done before I can play, which will never happen. Um, you know, it's selfish to put my desires first might be another one that a lot of people have. 
Um, I can't ask for support. So a lot of people are doing everything. Again, the superhuman um, belief that I have to do it all. I'm responsible for everything. When really you need to be asking your spouse, your children, other, hiring other people even for some support, right? One person cannot do it all and can't do it all for everyone. So many of the women and men I work with have been taking very little time for play and doing what lights them up and what is fun for them because they think it's selfish to put them first or, you know, and then they give all their time to everybody else. Um, same thing with money. A lot of times we can say, well, I don't have the money to do that. When really you probably do, you're just, you need to reallocate your money a little bit differently. Okay? So those are some common ones for passion, not living your passions. And opposite truths, right? It's not, it's self-care to put me first. It's self-love to make time for my passions or put money towards my passions. It's necessary. It's okay. It's good. Right? A lot of us, you know, didn't grow up seeing that. I saw a lot of work. Like I said earlier, you don't play until all the work is done. And that's a common one for a lot of us. And we know the work is never done. Um, we even feel guilty. So that's the other thing I find, too, is that there's, you know, I shouldn't be happy or I shouldn't be having fun if, so-and-so is so miserable, whether it's your spouse, a parent, et cetera. So it's like, why, why should we enjoy ourselves if other people in our life are having a really hard time, right? When the truth is, you are responsible for your own happiness. You are responsible for yours, and other people are responsible for theirs. No need to feel guilty for having fun and doing things that light you up. It's actually essential for health and healing to do that. And the final area is purpose career. So again, a lot of us have beliefs around purpose and career that you're going to notice some interchangeable ones here. The I'm not good enough to do X, Y, and Z. I'm not smart enough to do X, Y, and Z. I have to work hard to succeed, grow my business. And when we believe something, it makes it so. It makes it true. That's why it is so important to stop and look at, what is this really true? Do I really have to work hard to grow my business? Sure, I'm going to have to show up, but I'm not going to have to, like, make myself sick in order to get a promotion or to grow my business or to get a raise. Right? That is... That is not a belief you want to hold on to, right? I am succeeding or growing my business with ease. I'm getting a raise with ease. There's often a belief that I can't do what I love and make money. A lot of my clients have that. So an opposite truth might be I am doing what I love and making an abundance of money, right? That is a good opposite truth to work with. Let's see some other ones here. Um, yeah, I, grew, I mean, I grew up with parents that both still work in a factory. So even me owning my own business, like, I, there's no way I could successfully own my own business. I'm not smart enough. It's not possible because I didn't grow up with that. So I really had to work on shifting those beliefs as well as the not good enough one, given all the criticism I received growing up. And then, of course, the work hard one. I've had to work with a lot in order to shift that pattern. <laughs> or I'd still be sick with MS, right, and um, horrible anxiety and depression as well. All right, so again, moving through these seven life areas, and you don't have to do all seven right now. You don't need to overwhelm yourself, okay? Maybe just pick one area to start with, the one that is the most debilitating or the one you want to shift most right now, and take some time to reflect on and discover the belief or beliefs that might be causing the breakdown in that area. And if you are perplexed, again, um, that's oftentimes when you need to look outside yourself because it's really, sometimes it's really hard unless you've been doing this type of work a long time. And even if you have, you're going to need that outside perspective. I still need it. 
sometimes people to say, hey, look at this, <laughs> in a way that's loving and compassionate, right? Not, not beating you up, but um, just shining the light, right, on what is, what is lurking, what is the shadow, what is the belief that's lurking, that's keeping me stuck in this unhealthy pattern or in this breakdown or in this health issue. And then finding and writing an opposite, what I call an opposite truth. And again, you don't have to believe it 100% right now. Just believing it 1% can help start to shift it. So, you know, people often ask me, so just becoming aware of the belief isn't going to shift it. Not usually. Um, There are cases where, yes, just becoming aware of it can start the process and sometimes even completely shift it. Right? And oftentimes, because we're human, it might need some TLC and oftentimes practice and using tools over time to really help shift the belief fully, 100%. And that's because we were so ingrained growing up and, again, past lives, DNA ancestors. These beliefs have been so deeply ingrained in our sub subconscious oftentimes, unconscious, subconscious, that it'll take time and practice and tools to shift them. Right? You'll catch yourself. And again, when you catch yourself, you're not going to want to beat yourself up. You're going to want to say, oh, here I am thinking that, that thought or that limiting thought or belief again. Okay. Okay, there it is. I'm not going to push it away. I'm just going to stay with it for a minute in the awareness of it. Okay, I'm not going to make it bad or wrong. I'm not going to judge my belief. (laughs) I'm not going to get angry or pissed off because I still believe it, because it's still there. I'm going to give it some love and attention. And then I'm going to start planting the seed for what I would like to be the truth. I am good enough. I am lovable just as I am today. I am smart. I am receiving money with ease. I'm doing what I love in receiving money, an abundance of money with ease. It's possible. Right? It's possible. I'm always supported. I'm learning who to trust more every day. Right? I'm always guided, loved, and supported. So those are just some opposite truths, right? And we we begin, I'm actually teaching you one of the tools right now, is when you become aware of the belief, the thought. And people say, well, what's the difference between a belief and a thought? A belief is just the thought you keep on thinking. Okay. So you become aware of it. You might write it down, say it out loud or silently. And then you're going to start to transition into speaking, writing, affirming the opposite truth over and over and over. Now, some people, um, and I I call this our desires too, so an opposite belief or truth can also be a a heart or a soul desire um, within the process that I teach, the therapeutic meditation process. So, um, So, yeah, be gentle, be compassionate. Know that it can take time to shift these, especially if they were due to trauma. And a lot of us, a lot of our beliefs come from past trauma, this lifetime and others. So it can take time. Be gentle, be patient, learn tools and use them consistently. Have compassion for yourself. Okay? So some of you I know like to do tapping or EFT, great. I'm not a big fan of that. That feels like hard work to me. I'd rather do what I just, uh, the mini little tool that I just shared with you, where you become aware of the belief, you hold it for a little bit, you write it perhaps, and then speak, write, affirm the opposite truth over and over and over several times. You may do this several times during the day, once you become aware of the beliefs you hold, or just when one pops up, you can catch it there on the spot and you'll get better at doing that. (laughs) 
the more you become aware of it, the, the more you'll be able to catch it um, before it goes too far. Another tool that I teach and I use is the guided therapeutic meditation practice. So everybody, whether you are in, um, if you're on the podcast in my free community, there is a sample guided practice. Um, any of the free gifts that you sign up for, any of my free gifts that you sign up for, the Divine You, Vibrant Body, Abundant Life Starter Kit, um, those all have a sample guided practice. And in the guided practice, there is a section where I do this little back and forth holding a belief, and then holding the opposite truth. Okay, so whether you're awake or not, you can completely drift off of, or fall asleep. If you set an intention to shift the belief and you're sleeping during that part, it'll still do it. Okay, that's what I, I recommend highly to listen to it at bedtime as you fall asleep. So you guys have a sample guided practice to use. Um, those of you who are in a program with me, whether it's the Divine You program uh, the Vibrant Body and Abundant Life Mastery Program, or my new program, Self Love and Trust, which the door is just open for, you're going to get a variety of guided practices of varying lengths that are focused on specific beliefs. Right? So you're going to get two guided practices for each of the 10 keys, especially if you're in my year long program that have different beliefs woven in um, and the different life areas. But you can try the sample practice out and just begin by using that. And if you use it consistently at bedtime as you fall asleep, I also recommend you use it at least once during the day or in the morning or after work. Um, you're going to start to notice a shift in that belief. And how do you notice you're shifting a belief? Well, your thoughts are going to be able begin to shift. The way you feel about yourself is going to shift. Your actions are going to shift. And those life areas are going to, be, are going to start shifting as well. Okay. So that's, that's the short answer on how you know if your beliefs are shifting. Um, you're going to feel it. You're going to see it and feel it in your life. All right. So I'm going to take a quick look here and see if there are any questions coming in. Jean says, hi, could you tell me what is holding me back from healing? I do all kinds of energy clearing and continue to create the opposite of my desires. Thank you. Okay, so Jean, um, as I said in the beginning of this class, I'm not sure if you had heard me or not, um, a little more information would have been helpful. But what I'm getting, I'm just going to take a minute, tap into my my spidey skills, my intuition, is not knowing what it is that you're trying to heal. The first thing that comes in is that you're actually going to need to, you're actually going to need to physically, not physically, you're actually going to need to look at what beliefs might I be holding in that life area, the area that I want to heal. Okay, so as I went through in the beginning today, um, energy clearing is great. And yet, if you don't know what it is that you're trying to clear, you might have to actually work with shifting the belief in your subconscious. Okay? Sometimes energy work and energy clearing can do the job, but in this case, obviously it's not. Um, I'm also getting, with the limited information you gave me, that you definitely have some family stuff that you're going to need to look at, both um, what what was money like in your family growing up? What was the message you got? What did you see or hear? So I'm getting there might be some money stuff that's an issue for you that's affecting your health and also relationship stuff. Um, I can't tell if it's a partner and or currently with your, your parents or your siblings, but you're going to need to set some boundaries. Uh, you're going to need to set and keep some healthy boundaries. So you might have a belief that it's not okay to express your wants, needs, and desires. It's not okay to stick up for yourself. So you're going to need to work on shifting those beliefs um, is what I get. So um, if you're listening to this live right now, if you want to give me more information, um, I can maybe give you a little more guidance. Uh, you can also email me, tanya at tanyapenny.com, if you feel that you want um, to go further and explore that. All right, let's see what else here. 
All right. Um, on the webcast, I don't see anybody's hands raised on the phone. Star two if you're on the phone, but I have a few more webcasts. Okay. Carla says that, um, Tanya, I've been experiencing thyroid issues for over 20 years. I'm on medication, but I'd like to heal the root cause of this um, and hopefully not be on medication anymore. So, um, Carla, so from a mind-body healing philosophy, a thyroid issue, and I don't know if you have hypo or hyperthyroid or if it's Graves or Hashimoto's, um, but let me just give you a little bit of guidance not knowing which one it is. I'm getting it's maybe a combination of both for you, but I'm not sure. Um, if you have hyperthyroid issues, hyper, it means that you need to work with letting go of trying to be responsible and controlling situations and people in your life. I kind of see a spider web actually where you're, you're, too, you're entangled with other people's stuff. You're hyper involved. You are either speaking up or doing things that it's really not your responsibility. Okay. And then on the flip side, the hypothyroid, and I believe Hashimoto, Hashimoto's is actually a combo of each. Um, it's kind of a, a back and forth. Um, hypo is you're not expressing enough in other areas of your life. You're not expressing your wants, needs, and desires. You're not setting and keeping healthy boundaries around time and money and even the way that people are treating you. Um, you need to stand up for or speak up for yourself more and then control and be less responsible um, with other people and other situations in your life. You might even be taking on too much at work is what my guidance says. So that can be part of the hyper. You're doing too much, you're being too responsible, you're taking on too much at work and you're not saying no enough at work. So those are some pieces um, to that. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, I'm looking for a relationship one here on the webcast. Okay, um, cool. I'm going to take a guy here. So Ken says, hello, Tanya. Thank you for the call. I've learned a lot already. Um, I grew up with a mom who was very hypercritical and a dad who was pretty absent. I struggle in relationships um, with women and with men. Can you give me any advice on what I need to shift? So, all right, so your mom was hyper-controlling. So I'm going to guess that you tend to get in relationships with women, assuming that um, you're straight. Um, you're, you tend to get in partnerships with women who are also controlling. They either want to control you or um, maybe they're critical of you as well. And so the belief you're going to need to work with is, Women are controlling and critical. The opposite is I'm attracting partners. Um, I'm attracting women that are loving, loving, nurturing, and supportive might be a good opposite. And your father was absent. So I'm going to guess that in male relationships, friendships, again, assuming you're straight, you haven't said otherwise, um, that you tend to have male friends, the relationships don't go very deep or you really don't have a lot of male friends because your father was absent. So I can't trust men. Um, men never show up for me. Um, I can't have a deep, meaningful conversation with a man, um, with friends, however you want to say it. Opposite truth is, you know, I'm attracting men who want to have deep, meaningful relationships. I have a community of male friends that is supportive and we always show up for each other. Those might be some opposite truths that you want to start working with um, in both of the two tools, the guided meditation practice, um, as well as just the on the spot um, catching it yourself and writing, affirming one and then the other. Okay. Um, and again, for those of you who decide to join me for um, a program, we go a lot deeper into more tools as well as um, you get guided practices 
that are specific, have specific beliefs around each of these life areas, not just a, a general practice. So those are all, those are all really great questions. All right, let's see, that's feeling, feeling pretty complete and I don't see anybody's hands raised. A lot of the other Q&A on the webcast were um, relationships, actually. Um, wait, I see a money one here that I wanna take. Yeah, I'm gonna take one more, I'm gonna take this one, one last question. Um, <laughs> Susie says, Tanya, you sound just like me in that I've never had a problem making money, but I never have enough. No matter how much I make, I never have enough. I'm in a lot of debt right now. What can you, um, what advice can you give me? Ah, yeah, Susie. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of my clients struggle with, can struggle with this. I would say 50% struggle with, they make a lot and they just never have enough or they make a good amount, um, and then 50% struggle with just making enough at all. So in your case, there's something there that you learned growing up that actually money, I'm just getting that money was either, it was evil to have money, or if you had a lot of money and you didn't share it, it was greedy. And also the belief, like I had, that women Women only know how to spend. They're not good at managing and growing money. So those are the beliefs, the, the limiting or negative beliefs you're going to want to work with. Um, and then as well as the opposite truth, right? Having money is good. Having enough money for myself, um, saving money for myself is not greedy. I don't have to give it away. I'm not responsible for everyone else and, and making sure they have enough. Um, at the expense of myself, right? That's not healthy. And I'm good at managing and growing my money. Okay, so again, over time, consistently on a daily basis, planting the seeds for those opposite truths while still giving love and compassion to the self-limiting or negative belief, right? We're not trying to, you know, we're not hating it. We're not, you know, saying it's bad or wrong. It just is. Right, it just is. So, um, so thank you, everyone, for at, who asked questions today. I appreciate that. Um, if you just jumped on or haven't heard the whole call today, it'll be up shortly on our podcast page, or you can go to the replay link um, in your email that was sent out today or the other day, depending on which community you're in. And again, I'd, I'd love to invite you, if you haven't yet, to sign up for the free gift, um, either Divine You or Vibrant Body. Um, an Abundant Life Starter Kit, where you'll have a sample guided meditation practice to use to help shift your beliefs. And um, I'd love to invite you if you want to go deeper with me into the Divine You program, the Self Love and Trust program, which the door is just open for, or if you want all 10 Vibrant Body and Abundant Life Keys, um, the Vibrant Body and Abundant Life Mastery program, where each month we go into another life area, another key. And we really focus on that. And, um, you know, one of the great things is you receive guided practices with those specific beliefs uh, woven in and the opposite truth. So thank you, everyone. And if you're on iTunes or Podbean or Stricter listening to this, uh, all you have to do is head over to tanyapenny.com and click podcast on the top of the screen. Um, there's also a link at the top of the screen that says programs. Um, if you want to go check out the programs that I mentioned, there's a little drop down and you can find all the details. Um, if you sign up by May 29th for the self, uh, self Love and Trust program, there is a bonus, uh, releasing perfection bonus, which is a big one for most of the people I work with. And um, yeah, feel free to spread the love. Uh, feel free to share this podcast with other people. And um, let's see what else. Progress, remember, progress, not perfection. Baby steps, patience, compassion for yourself. Healing can take time, right? It can take time. Asking all of your higher levels for support, your something bigger, is also really helpful um, when you're trying to heal or shift something, including your beliefs. And um, gosh, what else? Next month in June, we're going to start back with having not just me, but also other experts. Next month's topic 
key is self-acceptance, love, and worth. So I look forward to seeing you in June and um, looking forward to supporting you in a deeper way in one of the programs when and if it feels right for you. All right, you guys. Have a beautiful weekend. Love you. Bye. The moderator has left the conference.